some examples of pottery and sculpture made with coils. I'll do a demonstration of the method and explain my approach to designing a coil-built pot. Let's look first at this classic Greek hydra made in the 6th century BC. The thing that I want to emphasize and be observed here is the precise control of the silhouette. All formal Greek pottery represents man's domination over natural elements and materials. This colorful coil-built pot was made by an American Indian of New Mexico. And this sophisticated black bowl was made by Maria Martinez, a contemporary Indian potter living in New Mexico. It is carefully scraped smooth and decorated. The black color comes from a primitive method of firing in a semi-open fire. And this little bowl, while ancient in appearance, was recently made by a 10-year-old boy. As with Maria's pot, it has been polished with a stone before firing, and the handsome model surface color results from firing in the ashes of a fireplace. This is a contemporary coil vase by Karl Martz of Indiana University. Notice the flowing lines of the contour. No matter where we pause to look at this handsome piece, the silhouette is always pleasing. In thinking about design for a piece of pottery, let us consider the potential inspiration which might be derived from an egg, a perfect ovoid form, small end up or down. Here are some sketches of pots inspired by an egg form. an elongated cone shape. A pear, which might suggest pots with two lobes. Or this little gourd. the squash. How about this funny little watermelon with its interesting surface? Hey, look at this dipper gourd. Good shape and great surface. Using these four categories as a starting point, an egg, carrot, pear, and gourd, I've made quick little thumbnail sketches of pots inspired by these good natural forms. The drawings are a sort of exercise to help me visualize what I want before beginning with the clay. Let me hasten to say that what I end up with will not be an imitation pear or a ceramic carrot or a gourd. Mere imitation of natural objects or manufactured objects is not art. A ceramic apple or a bunch of grapes, for instance, I would consider novelty. And the sincere artist of integrity is not concerned with novelty. I suppose that what I am seeking as I sketch and plan is related to the ancient Chinese potter's observation that nature abhors the broken line. The tight contour of the apple became the ideal, 
along with the firm design of the chariot. The perfect roundnesses that occur again and again in the natural world were highly respected as basis for aesthetically pleasing design. As my sketches develop and my ideas crystallize, I will begin to concentrate on the one idea which seems to present the most potential. And over a series of several more drawings, I should be able to improve and refine my original idea. This method will not work with young children, nor with those who do not draw well. And I firmly believe that the person who attempts to design for a particular material or medium should first have had some experience in working with that material. I also believe that any time spent preparing planning for a project is not wasted. I found that this system of developing drawings worked well with high school and college students who had a background in drawing and design and who have had some experience in working with clay. As a teacher, I have to combat the tendency of students to make one drawing and fall in love with it, excluding any other possibility or the prospect of refinement or development of ideas. Now when the thumbnail sketch meets my approval, I will make a full-size drawing of the pot and the clay work is ready to begin. The drawing of the vase I intend to make is about 19 inches tall. I've drawn horizontal lines across the drawing every inch to aid in measuring the plan and comparing it with the clay pot later on. I prefer to make the bottom of the pot from a slab rather than coils. Coiled bottoms have a tendency to crack. I find by measuring my plan that the bottom should be five and a half inches across. And I visualize the top view as being not round but somewhat pointed like a watermelon seed. This outline is sketched onto the clay slab, which is then cut out with this thin bladed fettling knife or with a needle. The bottom piece is placed on a plaster back mounted on a decorating wheel. Now we're ready to start rolling the clay ropes or coils. Students always ask me what diameter the coil should be, and I generally look over the fingers of their hand and uh, point out one of their fingers and suggest that the coils should be this big. Sometimes the coil that you are rolling will become out of round, lopsided. When this happens, just stand the coil up on edge like this and pat it square and continue rolling. If you keep on rolling after the coil has become out of round, it will probably just get worse. With this piece of comb, I will score or roughen the edge of the base, then apply slip to the roughened area to improve the bond. first coil is then placed in position and the joint worked together. Don't paint slip over the entire surface of the pot. It seems natural for students to do this, but it just makes a gooey mess. We don't smooth this way. You slip only in the joints. Now that the first coil is in place, I will use a little reinforcing coil to strengthen the joint. With this modeling tool, I'm working the reinforcing coil into both the base and the first coil. Then the joint is smoothed. More scratching and slip and the process of applying coils is repeated.
It is wise, I believe, to stagger your joints for strength, like laying bricks. The joints should not come one above the other, but at different places around the pot. As the coils are laid up, I must regard my plan to get the proper slant to the sides. With the left hand inside for support, the first three coils are knit together to make the wall of the pot. Push that tool in deeply, don't just skim a little clay over the surface. Then after these vertical strokes have been made, the wall is smoothed. If you can still see evidences of coils at this point, better knit some more because the coils haven't been worked together well enough. Here's this little modeling tool. It's shaped like a thumb, and it's the most useful tool I own. However, you could use a pencil to do this job. On the inside, the same knitting and smoothing is done while supporting the piece with a hand outside. Let's pause here and find out where we are. I find that the piece is one and three quarters inches tall and about six inches wide. So by checking the drawing, I can find out how accurate my work is so far. The pot is now grown by three more coils and the knitting together and the smoothing are repeated. Constantly turn the pot and consider all views. Try to visualize the completed form and anticipate the incompleted portion. Continue to check the measurements and the shape of the clay and compare with your plan. Hey, we're getting up there. If you find that the cross section is a little small, this can usually be corrected by gently stretching out to size. Or if the pot has become too large, as sometimes happens, we can cut out a V notch and squeeze in the side. We call this operating. This resulted in a bulge here. If I wanted to bring the sides in uniformly, I'd have to cut to operate in four or five places. Now for the next phase of this procedure. Here's a piece of wood wrapped in string. It could be wrapped with burlap. When the sides are up about this high, we can begin to paddle out the irregularities to improve the contour to achieve a nice flowing silhouette that will look good from any view. This paddle is a great aid in refining the contour. It's almost indispensable to the coil method. What I'm looking for and trying to achieve may be illustrated in this comparison of a balloon and a sack of potatoes. No, that's not an object of pop art. It's a real sack of potatoes. I've seen too many coil pots which resemble the lumpy, uncontrolled contour of the bag of potatoes, mainly because of a lack of planning. What I want is more like the taut surface of an inflated balloon. It's getting taller, and the neck is uh, too small to get my hand inside anymore, so I'll have to knit each coil instead of working them together three at a time. If the clay walls are a little too wet, you won't be able to use the paddle effectively. So it's best to let the clay stiffen a little before shaping it with a paddle. It's a good idea to let the lower portion of the pot stiffen a little. So 
so that it will support the weight of the clay above. Of course, you must keep that top edge damp so that moist clay coils can be added. Well, here we are, ready for the final piece. This top could be made with coils, but I've just pinched out this piece like a pinch pot, and this will be added as a finial, an accent which says this is it. The pot is finished off with a nice flare. It's not just cut off square with a knife. The treatment of the top edge, or the lip, or the rim, is very important, I feel, uh, because it provides a finishing touch it accents the whole piece. is given a final critical inspection and a final paddling. Check that contour very closely and make sure that it looks as uh, good as possible from all views. The forming process is now completed. This is as far as we can go now and the base is set aside to stiffen until it is leather hard. That is, it looks and feels leathery. It is now in ideal condition for carving and scraping. And by holding this section of a hacksaw blade rigidly, I'm trying to scrape down the high spots, the bumps, and stay out of the low spots. This is a wonderful tool for this job. Sometimes your fingertips are more sensitive to irregularities than your eye is. When the entire surface has been scraped, the hacksaw blade can be turned over and using the smooth side, scratches left by the teeth of the saw blade can be removed. This flexible metal kidney or rib can also be used very nicely for this purpose. The scratch marks made by the teeth could be left in if desired to give a little texture. You wouldn't have to scrape and smooth the surface at all. You might consider some sort of textural surface enrichment as in this planter which is vigorously textured with very soft clay applied to the moist walls. This covered jar has many textures made with various kinds of tools. Here's a different treatment with deep texturing, as in this planter whose surface bears the imprint of the potter's fingers. This makes a surface treatment which is very exciting to me. This is the way that it's done. Here's a partially completed planter in the moist clay stage. The coils are laid up as I've showed you worked together and smoothed inside, but just joined by downward strokes of the thumb or finger on the outside. You've got to be neat and precise. Don't get sloppy and mess over the surface too much. Here's another idea you might consider. This large pot was made by Karl Martz and hangs in his living room. Here's that egg shape again. The construction process is evident here and the coils remain exposed and are accurately paddled to shape outside. Can you see the marks left with the string wrap paddle? If you feel really ambitious and you, and you have plenty of clay and a large kill, you might try something like this five foot tall pot on my patio. With this coil method, you're not of course limited to making pottery. Sculpture can be built up hollow by the same means. Look at this expressive howling dog made by an American Indian. And this armadillo built up hollow by the same Indian culture. Here's my sculpture of King Solomon and the disputed child.
partitions have been built into the interior for added strength. Well, that's it. You've seen the process. We've looked at some examples of different ways of working with coils. I've tried to stress good craftsmanship and good design. So now it's up to you to make this clay and the coil method express what you want to say. Oh, my God.